Uh, Matt O'Callaghan, Matt, I suppose, look, um, the, the origins of Bruff Rugby, 50 years going, um, we all know that it's not easy to keep clubs going in the current environment, but the, the, the club has made it through 50 years, uh, and it's been quite an achievement. I suppose it's a phenomenal achievement, and I suppose what's even more phenomenal is that we have with us here this evening one of the founder members, um, who is equally as enthusiastic about it today as he was 50 years ago and has made a massive contribution over the years. And I, I, I would say that that, that that is just one point that you could make about the success of the club is, is that type of, of continuity. But of course, it was a huge leap of faith back in, 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 in 1970 to form a rugby club out in a rural area. But I suppose rugby wasn't entirely alien or entirely new um, to that rural part of County Limerick because in the 20s, um, Kilmallock um, had a team for a number of years. So there was probably, you know, maybe 40 years on, there may have been a residual interest in rugby. And there was a team, believe it or not, for a shot while in Holy Cross. Um, so I suppose, but having said that, um, the ban was in force at the time, but I suppose uh, what helped it um, to get off the ground, I think there were probably two factors that helped it to get off the ground because when Brough originally uh, applied um, for ratification by the Munster branch, they were, one of, they, were, they were one of three clubs, new clubs that applied on the, on the particular evening in April 8 in 1970. We had Old Munchens, Barangari Sharks, and Brough. Now, strange to say, Old Munchens and Barangari Sharks went through on the nod, and Brough was deferred for further um, consideration and eventually ratified on the 14th of May, um, 1970. So, like, obviously, there had to be reservations, I suppose. Um, within the branch at the time as to the possibility or, or whether or not a club would succeed in a place like Brough. But then, um, you know, how, how do you think it would succeed in Ballingarry? So, you know, but that, that, that's, that, that, that is exactly the, 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 the very start of, of getting the club up and running. And I, and I, I would say, um, of course, the ban at that particular stage in 1970, and Willie would know the ban quite well, I'd say, because um, Willie was able to play both sides of it very well. He played with Limerick in 1974 in the Munster Championship. Um, but um, the ban at that particular stage was, it was observed more in the breach than in the observance. And um, uh, I, I think the second factor, which, you know, was a good grounding um, for a fledgling club would, was um, the fact of its proximity to Limerick City. And, and talking to Nick Cook recently, who was the co-founder with, with Willie, um, he pinpointed that as, as, as being a, a huge um, a launch pad, as it were, a huge starting point that you didn't have to travel that, that terrible far to get games. And there was a whole pile of games available because I remember on one of our visits to, to, to Connemara, you might remember it yourself, Willie, that yes. um, the whole narrative at that stage when Connemara were in senior football was the difficulty that they had in getting games because of their location. The nearest game they could get was in Galway City. And um, teams in Galway City were most disinclined to go, to, to go out to the far west. That's right, uh, yeah. Just to clarify that what Matt is talking about, uh, Connemara certainly were isolated way out in the middle of nowhere. And not only had their team, had they to they, they get in front of but their competition started to Sligo, Ballina and Mayo and down into the South, South Galway. I mean, if you were probably playing probably on a Sunday and you're probably working as well, you're now going all day long on Sunday to play a game of rugby. And it's extremely difficult. As I said, Matt, we were lucky, I suppose, because, like Nick just said, we were playing in Limerick in the North Munster League, the Junior League. We had matches, loads of matches. Now, just another thing there, on the Ballangari Sharks, they were actually the Ballangari Wasps, and they were okay. not of Cashel. 
you know, it's not just a case of me said about the Balagari Limerick. They were north of Cashel, okay. and they were started by a guy by the name of Willie Martin, who was a guard at the time. And they actually, we played Munster Junior rugby up there, Brendan Call and myself, for Munster. And they had a couple of, they bought three pitches, and they had surely two dressing rooms of incredible facilities. And they didn't last the pace, but they, they were totally isolated back. They were way up in the building over. And and old Munchens was a, a guy who was initiated. That was a, a brother of Larry Maloney's son, who next international from Brewery. His name was John Maloney. Yeah. So, and it went on and went on from there. But I can't you know if I work at That's what I was going to say anyway. Will you tell us about the about the band? Did on, you did you did you play on the band? band on the band, right? Uh, Matt just mentioned the band area. Yeah. There was a band. I have actually selected to play with Limerick on the twenty one on the twenty one football one time. And uh, a selector from Ula, who, needless to say, had a guy waiting in the wings to go in instead of me, informed the people that uh, this guy was ten rugby, so he he, he, would, he couldn't take any football for Limerick. So I got the bullet straight away. And needless to say, a man had his, his guy ready to come in. That was the only only incident I had with the band, really. But it wasn't your only brush with the, the GA authorities, though, Willie. No, no, no. We had we had several several uh, brushes with them, all right. <laughs> I suppose Willie, the, the 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 genesis of the idea. When when did that? Uh, where did that come from? Or, or how did how did where did the idea come from? And how did it, how did it start? Well, that time the G, the GA was finishing uh, like every other in September. You know, the competitions are over. They're all knockout competitions. They weren't going into Christmas for leagues and leagues and leagues, so they were all finished. So you were actually, you were actually idled in from September until maybe February or March, you know. And what would you do? You play a bit of soccer or something? So we just said, we maybe we might try a bit of rugby this year and see what happens. That's really how it came about, you know. And uh, we, I remember Pat O'Rourke and Arthur O'Keefe, who Matt would know. Um, we were just kind of saying maybe we'll try a game of rugby, and I knew Nick just did, and we got Nick just into the thing, and we said we had a shot at it anyway. It was very interesting, and our first match was against Charleville, as you as you know. Um, for, to this day, I can't remember who the referee was. I, I, he was totally. Uh, it didn't matter about him. <laughs> I got on well with him, Willie. Yeah, he blew the ref the whistle to start the match and blew to finish it. At <laughs> But it was a great old game and it was a fantastic, uh, it's a fantastic game and for us in the country areas, as you can understand, all Gaelic uh, parishes, you know, and they, 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 the rivalry between parishes was enormous. Like, but in law rugby, there was no such thing as that really, you made great friends, you know, so it had people to uh, mix a bit better than that. I mean, I went to dressing rooms and bluff after a Holland season and you'd have two guys looking at two other guys inside across the way and they said, Jesus, I was sent off with him or something. You know. The last time they met, they would have fought. <laughs> it was very good, very interesting. But sure, it made for a great, a great bit of camaraderie, really. And it was interesting and a great bit of a challenge as well. I mean, if you would think of it in 1973, 74, we contested an under-18 league final, an under-18 cup final in Limerick in the city where under Rahim was very, very strong at the time. So, I mean, there was only two years after being founded. So, I mean, and, and, and this, of that, out of that uh, a panel, about 15 of them hadn't played rugby before. Three, two of them had gone to Munchens, but they didn't play, but Sean Mikey Houlihan, but the rest of the lads were all local lads. But we contested a final, you know, and then two years after that, we contested a 20s final against Shannon. And not with the same players, no additional players again, because I remember John Maher played in that. And um, that, was, that was enormous for us to be achieved that we didn't just play a game of rugby with a junior team. We hosted into the underage, which was so important, because without the underage, where are we going to get players in rough? They weren't going to walk in the gate, you know? John, Sorry, guys, I suppose, you John, you're, you're, you're currently uh, involved or, or, or putting together a history or a, a, a book on the club. Uh, tell us firstly how how the research is going, and uh, secondly, any anecdotes or any interesting um, stories around the foundation. Uh, yeah, I mean, well, in terms of how the research is going, it's it's going very very slowly and gradually um, because I live in the Netherlands, 
and obviously travel is is quite difficult at the moment so any interviewing I'm, I'm doing has just been done over the phone but yeah I've interviewed um, about maybe 20 people 25 people so far and there's there's thankfully there's still things like the minutes from very early meetings that are still around and there's plenty of old match reports and things like that as well so it's great it's fantastic I mean I, I played with profs since I was eight and my father played a little bit with them as well but it's lovely getting to actually learn so much about the club and, and actually, you know, learn to appreciate it, I think, a bit more as well. The one, one of the things, I mean, lots of things stick out, but one in particular so far that I find particularly interesting is the fact that Willie and Nicholas, well, were you 19, Willie, when the club started? 19, yeah. yeah 19, yeah. And, and, and like, I mean, started mostly with, with fellas who were around that age, maybe a few who were a few years older, but not, not long out of their teens for the most part, if not still in their teens. And the fact that they became friends with a man from a completely different world from theirs in, in, in so many respects, the, the Colonel, Colonel O'Grady, who, um, who, who, whose land that the club was, was built on. Um, I mean, this is a fellow who was, I suppose, 40 years older than, than the vast majority of the lads who started the club. He fought in the Second World War. He was, um, you know, he, he holds a, a title that goes back eight centuries or so. Um, like he's part of a family, like he, he, he's the head or he was the head of one of Ireland's last ancient noble families, I think is the, the proper title for them. So from, I, I, I don't think it's inaccurate to say he's from quite a different world from, from Willie and Nicholas, but they became quite good friends and, and everyone, I mean, the Colonel isn't around anymore today, but anyone that I speak to about him speaks so, so warmly of him. Um, and, and, and the, I've, I've interviewed members of his family and they would say themselves that he was um, somewhat separate from the community. He, he, was, he, was, he, was, he lived kind of in a different world from them. I mean, he wasn't involved in the GAA and he wasn't schooled locally or, or anything like that. And he wasn't from the locality. I mean, he, he was originally from Carlo, but he would have spent most of his, his time prior to, uh, to, to coming to Brough outside of the country because he was schooled in England and, and he spent 10 years in... Uh, in India with the British Army. Um, so from, from a very different background, but as far as I can tell, it seems to get on very, very well with all the other lads. Um, and, and, I mean, the club, I don't know if the club would be here today if it wasn't for him because of, of, of what he gave to the lads at, at that early stage. When, when he, I agree with that, John. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. so I find, I mean, that's, that's just one little thing that I, that I found particularly fascinating is, is the contrast between the, the, the backgrounds of, of, of the lads and, and the colonel, but the fact that they became such good friends and he's spoken about so warmly. And, sorry, just to finish the point about him kind of being somewhat outside the community, it really brought him into it. Um, I, I interviewed his daughter, Eliza, recently, and she said he was actually quite a shy man. Um, and he, he, he would have very much wanted to have been part of a community. And he wanted to, to... He really would have wanted to be part of something like Brough. Um, and she said it just gave so much to his life to, to be centrally involved in it. So he, it's, it's, that's, that I find particularly heartwarming, I suppose. Where did the colours, the club colours and crest come from? Will he be the man to answer that, I think? The club colours are a bit of an issue. They're still an issue. Um, since it's been every place is GA strongholds, we had to avoid the various colours like Kilmallock or green, rough or red, Jesus. Now can't even black, and we had to make sure there was no, there was no, no connection, whatever. So someone said we we have a yellow. Oh, that was a bad move, but we're about twenty five years now trying to get rid of it, but whatever. We're working on it anyway. That's where the colours came from, really. Um, so we didn't get on so badly, really, you know. That, that's how they started, and that was the only reason they started. That meeting was inside in uh, Gleason's pub. Very first meet me had, and that's where I came up about the yellow jerseys, you know. <laughs> Jesus, that's uh, it. Different, different jerseys for the first few matches, really, didn't you? Didn't you use jerseys from some combined GA team? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a senior, a senior amalgamation team since all the whole of the clubs, they were kind of junior. They used to have to play in the senior championship, they would say, Bro, Fat Lack, and I'll get together, and they were called Holy Cross. Billy, as it happened, coincided with Matt's rugby. 
um, and we wore a Tipperary type jersey. Yeah, as far as I think I had a hold to them one day, so I held on to them, <laughs> and I used to look after them, so they walked in fine, you know. So that is grand to me. So that's where it goes. Matt, yeah. the, take take us back, I suppose, to the to the early kind of the competitive days and, and the first seasons in in the Monster Junior Leagues. When when did when did Brough start to to climb the table, Matt? I suppose just to take up something on on on, on what John said there. Um, like w w Willie and Nicholas, like were, I suppose, two two um, teenagers at the at, at the particular time, and I suppose the colonel came in, and uh, he, you know, he, he was probably a steadying influence in so far as that he had experience of rugby and rugby clubs due to his association um, with Gary Owen and and with 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 following Gary Owen, but right from the start, I suppose. Um, you know, for a club um, starting off, um, and, and Willie will agree with this, um, even for the first game, when when Brough, for the very first game, got out, uh, succeeded in getting out a team, and, and um, you know, that was an achievement in itself. But from then on, the numbers just grew and grew. Isn't that more or less what it was, Willie? Yes, and, um, we, actually had, we actually had a second team after a couple of months because yeah. of guys wanting to play and experience this bit of rugby. I mean, to be honest, I suppose, you think of it, even our first team at the time, the, the Nina Stonans, Brendan Carroll and all those, and Charlie Colan, Nick Sahar, they all played in Munchens College, would have played Senior Cup. But I mean, they probably more likely would not have never played rugby again if there was no rugby in Brough, basically, because they weren't going to travel from Ballingar. They were all country guys, you know. Uh, so they weren't going to play. So I mean, we—I I, can—I can remember trying to coach fellas how to play. Uh, Jesus, about an hour before the match, to tell them what to do, and what not to do. Tim and McCall have played with us. Mike, 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 and Ken Malik, Mike the hurler, Mike. Coolen. Uh, Mike Coolen played with us. Yeah, I mean, we had at least a mile long. Really, they were all, they were all nice guys. Like uh, Billy Higgins from Hepperstown was an incredible footballer. He played full back. I mean, Eugene Houlihan would have played with us if you know from Eugene. Eugene would have played with Trinity College like, and uh, we forward it one time. So, I mean, man, it, 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 there was a load. Of, as you said, Matt, it gathered, like, gathered momentum all the time. Yeah, people came in, people came in on time. Yeah. Well, I, I, I suppose, joined. in fairness, Willie, right from the, from the get go, um, the connection with, with St. Munchen's College, especially. Uh, was very very important, especially when St Munchens College was a boarding school, um, because you you had a lot of lads from the country around the Kilmallocks, the breweries, the Bruffs, you know, they were yeah. going to St Munchens, picking up rugby, and like um, uh, Bruff was the natural club for them when they, when when they were outside of the school setting. Well, the, the Munchens were the diocesan college, and all the guys. There was the only boarding school in town, I think, really. And most of the farmers would send their sons in for boarding. And like say, I do record playing playing for Bro with Bruff, a Bruff team. And I think seven of the pack at the time had gone, excluding Nick, this was at Rockwell. Seven of them, I think, had played with rugby with Munchens College. And to be honest, we had a fine side, you know, which was a good side. And they could all play rugby when you consider the big dealers and the, the same guys I mentioned a minute ago. The soup, Willie Egan, for example, Mike Quilty, fantastic uppers. Very, very good players who would have got, got on any senior team in town, really, if they had played that. But like, Munchens was a huge, Munchens was a huge plus for us, yeah, and it, it, and was for years later as well, you know. Yeah, the, the, the most notably with the under twenty success. But in answer to your original question, Raf, um, I, I I would say that connection probably accelerated, um, accelerated, um, how Brough moved moved through the ranks and were comp were competitive from a very very early stage like the, 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 there was a kind of a supply uh, a supply um chain there of, of of people like you know that playing with munchens and as willie said when you come back out the country like um rough was the natural place to play if you wanted to continue playing rugby which a lot of them did want to do yeah i suppose matt the if if you look at the a lot of the rural and country clubs, what they don't want to become is they don't want to become feeder clubs for 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 the for the city teams. And I suppose Brough have managed to to kind of sustain 
senior team is the whole way through from the junior leagues into their promotion to the senior ranks, and that, that's quite an achievement in itself. I, I suppose he, he, if you look back on it in its totality in the 50 years, mm. I suppose it was an ex, it was an extraordinary achievement to win the All Ireland under 20 in 2000. Um, you know, I think certainly the first and probably the only cl junior club at the time that has ever done it. Like obviously, that 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 gave the momentum, uh, and, and and the next big step had to be promotion. Promotion came in 2004. That was a very near miss the year before um, when um, Brough just missed out on promotion and, and, and points difference. Um, literally came down to the last game in, in Kilbally on Park and we just failed to beat Kilkenny by enough um, to, to, to get up because it was decided on points difference. Now even talking to Michal Leahy about that the other day and Michal was manager for 11 or 12 years during all those years and um, he, he was a very definite of the opinion that, um, you know, that it may have been lucky that we missed out, that we weren't quite ready at that particular time. But, you know, 16 years speaks for itself. And I suppose to put it into real context, in that 16 years, a lot of, lot of clubs have come and gone. But such huge clubs of Irish rugby, like Estonians, like Wanderers, like Bechtoff Rangers, you know, during that time, um, two of them are still playing junior football, Estonians and Bechtoff Rangers. Wanderers fell into junior football and, and uh, they, they have come back. But it gives you a sense like that if you go back, um, if you go back about 30 years, go back 25 years, even 20 years, like those names, to think that Brough could rub shoulders with him first of all, you know, and be in the same pitch as him, uh, competing with him would like to be competing far more successfully than they were competing. Like, is an, an enormous achievement. And I think it puts the whole, it gives you a, a kind of a global view of, of the, the extent of the success. John, there was Transfield Cup wins in the 80s and Junior Cup uh, wins in the 80s as well, wasn't it? They, 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 you know, they, they didn't spend all those time in the junior ranks just trying to get promotion. They were, they were winning competitions too. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And I mean, particularly... At underage level, I mean, I, I think probably it's at underage, I suppose, that I would be, be more familiar with their successes from, from that period, uh, particularly in the community games and that. I mean, that was fantastic for the, the club in later years when they did actually get promoted, um, the, the experience that lads earned uh, at that level. Um, but yeah, I mean, Brough always would have been very, very competitive. And like Matt says, we came very close to getting promoted uh, from the, round, the junior round robin before we actually did go up. Um, and, and I mean, like the, the talent that the club was producing in the years prior to becoming senior was obvious as well from the players that Brough were sending in. So, I mean, you the likes of uh, Owen Cahill going into Shannon and Peter Malone going into to Gary Owen and obviously John Hayes was going into Shannon as well. But the difference then that came once we did go senior is that lads weren't going into play for senior clubs because we were a senior club and we were able to retain them. So that's probably part of the reason why Brough have managed to, to stay. I mean, again, we've had a few near misses as well. I mean, we've come close to going back down junior as well. But I think the fact of being able to retain the vast majority of our, of our players once we did go senior uh, was, was a huge difference as well. Yeah. Tell us about the, the promotion season, uh, what it meant. You know, we, we, we all know that obviously the Munster Junior Leagues, that the travel is confined within the province, but uh, that step up to, to senior rugby, it puts, it puts an added burden on clubs with travel, with expense uh, and, and with all the organisation that goes with it, doesn't it? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, just like if you think about it, when we go playing a game up in the north, you have to go on a Friday. Uh, obviously, you have to get a 30-seater bus you're bringing a squad of probably 22 players. You'd have five subs on the bench, but you'd always bring some bench cover. You'd have um, maybe two to three coaching staff on top of that, probably a physio on top of that as well. So, I mean, you're, you're putting like, and, and you know, you have one or two added onto that then as well. So you're putting up the bones of, of 30 people, if not more, in a hotel overnight. Um, the bus driver, obviously, then as well. Um, so, so, I mean, it's, it's a huge expense for, for any club. Um, but it's necessary as well. I mean, the, the, it's, it's on a few occasions we did travel up on the morning of a match 
But I mean, if you're if you're going on a four or five hour bus journey, you're likely to be very stiff from it. So it's essential to to go up the night before, I think. But it is it's it's a huge expense, you know. And, and I and I think that's part of the reason why people are probably quite keen on the idea of uh, of changing the senior leagues back to um, at least a partially provincial model again, you know. Willie, I suppose, tell us, Tara, take us back to the to the game in which you clinched the promotion from the uh, from from the junior ranks to to senior ranks. That'd be Paul Rain, I think. Yeah, be the final. Yeah, game. Paul Rain, Willie. Yeah, played C point that year as well. Yeah. Um, no, I wasn't a great watcher of matches, Raphael. I, I could be walking <laughs> miles for the games are on, so I wouldn't. <laughs> but I do recall I had a son playing in that. Actually, Stephen played in that. Um, uh, it was a fantastic achievement. Now I think Nigel Carr actually was doing the commentary up on the roof at the time. The famous Nigel Carr came with our army forward, and we had a great weekend. Needless to say, we all, however, on the day after the we went to Aberdeen uh, Stadium, I think that's right, and uh, Munster were beaten by Wasps in the European Cup. But uh, outside of that, um, again, like uh, Ger Fitzgerald was the coach uh, with Paco Fitzgerald. That's right, John. I think, yeah, Paco Fitzgerald and Dave Classy played with us at the time. Mm. And we, we, we were looking to beat C Point now, I must say, at the time. Uh, that was an appalling uh, day up in Dublin, Willie. Uh, conditions uh, were appalling. Appalling, oh, appalling. Yeah, appalling. Yeah, yeah. Because the, the pitch was out in the middle of nowhere and the wind was incredible. But we won the game anyway, and uh, that's, we became senior. I mean, matches saying they only got by William Dollar in the 20s in 2000, and what, 2002, where is it? No, 2000. 2000. 2001. 2000, yeah. 2000, 2001. We won the under 16s in, in Belfast in uh, 1996. You know, uh, we beat um, Bayern in the final, I think, and Shaggy, what you call him, was playing the wing, called him a pen for him. He never bangs down after an island. What's his name? Shane Morgan, is it? Shane Morgan was playing the wing, yeah. So we had a great 16s team. John Maher was in charge of the team at the time. Fantastic result for us as well. And then we went down to 18s after that, didn't we? we Lands on road and in the twenties after that. So but our underage Raphael was, was was probably the secret, I think. It was almost fairly competitive. I mean, our biggest advantage, I suppose, would have been the families that we had. I mean, when you start to turn up being forced, you had the Brittany Carl, Jamie Sahara, myself, Brittany Carl, that's a Jabalone, you know, Mikey Cattle. Then afterwards, Mikey Cattle's sons playing. Jabalone's four sons, winning four sons playing. I too thought playing. So it's a whole family thing. And it continued and continued to this day. Like, uh, Ray, who played with us in the, in the 18s and 1970s, four or five. He had no it in the first day. So, I mean, it's just a family oriented club, really, which has, I think, I think it helps him. Uh, there was a huge uh, success in the Munster Senior Cup in, in 2011, but not only did you manage to topple close rivals Gary Owen, you, you, went, you went on and ended up winning the Bateman Cup. Yeah, that was, that was an extraordinary, uh, that was an extraordinary, it's a big cup. because it, it, it probably was the perfect Munster Cup to win, in so far as that to win it, Brough had to be at Shannon, Constitution, and and um, then Gary on in the final, and you're right. Went on to win uh, win the win the, the the Bateman Cup, and and that, that wasn't easy either because um, I I distinctly remember the semi final against UCD, which mm. was on in 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 you probably remember it, lads, um, which was on in Kilmallyon Park, and um, right. Rolf at one stage looked absolutely dead in the water and. And going out of the Bateman Cup, but um, came back and two dramatic late tries um, turned it right around, and 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 uh, th that was the day that we really won the won the Bateman Cup. Yeah, and it was I mean the, scored, the, by, scored by John Shot, Stephen Shine. He might have even scored two tries that day. I'd say it was two two tries scored in the last yeah. ten minutes of the game, yeah. and we only won the game by two points. So was, you'd be sick watching it. <laughs> But um, and, and even like the, the teams, just to go back to the, the teams that list the match listed off there, uh, like you had a Carcon team with Simon Zebo playing, you had Conor Murray playing scrum half for Gary Owen, uh, and you had Paddy Jackson playing out half for John Gannon in the final uh, of the Bateman Cup. So 
I mean, there were serious teams that, that, that we were taking on in, in, at several different rounds of the, of the competition. Of course, not only that, but you've also produced uh, internationals. Uh, Richie Flanagan, Peter Malone with the Irish Under-20s uh, World Cup side that went to uh, toured, uh, played in Australia. John Hayes, of course, uh, Munster, Ireland and Lions. And George Clancy, international referee. So the, the club has, has, has definitely punched above its weight with regards to turning out uh, top players and, uh, and officials within the game. I suppose John Hayes was a huge figure um, in, 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 in the club and um, not only was he a club hero but I suppose he, he was a national hero um, for rugby and I suppose in, 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 in a way John Hayes' success um, probably challenged um, you know the, the others the, those that, that, that came after him and they, they could see what could be achieved and like certainly his um, his profile did so much for Rough Rugby Club that, you know, that it sort of laid down a challenge um, to those that are involved in the club to, 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 to sort of, you know, to raise their game and, and to match it and, and match, um, you know, match the expectation of a club that produce a player of the calibre of John Hayes. Yeah, John. I suppose if, from from your point of view and and with the the research you're doing, uh, looking back at the club, we see the, the the possibility of the new provincial structures coming in. How important do you think it is? You know, this is a chance, I suppose, for the IRFU now that if they did want to reset the domestic game, that they do it right and they do it that in a to use the buzzword sustainable way. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm in favour of the idea. I mean, it, it's so what's been mooted is, as far as I know, that you would have two. Um, am I correct in saying that there would be a, kind of the two top leagues would operate on an All Ireland basis, and then the senior leagues below that would operate on a provincial basis, similar to the junior clubs. Yeah. Is that, that's, yeah. 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 I mean, I, 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 I can definitely see a lot of benefits to it. Like I said a little while ago, it's a huge expense for a club to have to 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 do any game that requires an overnight stay beforehand um, and particularly at the moment clubs are, are, are quite cash strapped you know so there's, there's kind of a, a pragmatic benefit to it in that sense but also I think you can really you, you would get bigger crowds or you would capture people's interest more I think with more local derbies than what you would with games against teams from the other side of the country now, there, there, there is, I mean, there is one negative to it that I can see as well, in the sense that when I was growing up, I mean, I, I only stopped playing rugby with Ruff uh, two years ago, but I played senior with them for, for over 10 years, and I got to see Northern Ireland a lot more than what I probably would have otherwise, and I know that there's, I, I can think of several of my, my teammates who have friends in the North now as a result of travelling up to the North, and their family are friends with other families up in the north as a result of it. So that is one kind of maybe negative side effect of it if, if, if we were to go a bit more parochial with it. But at the same time, I think if you had the likes of UL Bowes or Nina or, or you know, clubs that are much closer to Brough, coming out to Brough for a game, that you'd get bigger crowds and you would have more interest than what you would have, say, if, if it was Belfast Harlequins or someone like that coming down. I'd be interested to hear what the others think of it, though. Willie? Well, um, I think what John said there, it was a novelty, certainly, playing in Stonians. And, you know, we'd never been to Stonians. Stonians are a famous club, let's say. And uh, so many players play with Ireland from Stonians. As you go up the stairs to the, to, to the upstairs in Stonians, you look at the wall and all the photographs, my God, you wonder where you are. Now, the one down thing about it, I was out there one day and uh, some guy asked me, he says, uh, Where's Brophilly? You know, is is it behind Trelly? Said no, no, it's not no. But no one knew where Brough was. Well, you can understand that, you know. But it was great going up that time. But I think at the minute with the, the Southern Conferences that like John is calling there with Dolphin and UL Bowes and Crest and all them, it, it would make it for easier for people to play rugby. If you know what I mean. That's true. Yeah. We have guys at the moment who haven't time to go on Friday, haven't time to be out at 10 o'clock at night on a bus coming home because of wives, girlfriends, families. And only the other day I was talking to a prop and he was saying he was thinking of giving it up because he said he hasn't the time to be going up on a Friday. He's a bit of farmer as well. 
So I said, it's going to change now. He said, I said, it's only for a Saturday driving to Cork or Cashel or Clanwell or whatever it is. And he was delighted. So just to give you an idea, I'm sure, you know, we, are, we, are, we have an awful demand on players. You're asking them to train three times a week. And then you're asking them to go leave on Friday to go to the North of Ireland and come back late on Saturday night. And I think that whole thing has been finished now and it's time to move back again to what it was which with the Southern Conference, you know. So, Matthew, you're taking it. I, 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 would agree, I would agree with it for, um, for, for the reasons that both of the lads have, have said. Um, John, they are taking up the point about him. Local rivalry, there's, there's nothing like rival, local rivalry to whet interest. But um, I, I, I agree totally with William. I, I think he really put his finger on it there because I, I think the model as it, as it, as it pre presently exists is, is moribund and, and um, um, <clears throat> it, it needs to be, there has to be, a, there has to be a change because like there, there are great constraints in people's time and it, players have become more mobile now and it's 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 very very hard um to maintain them in ordinary circumstances you must remember that it's a, it's an amateur sport in the main now not in all cases but in in, in, in the main but um as willie said you're asking guys to train three nights a week and like let's face it um uh, the weekend trip to the north, as John has said and pointed out, it's a 30 hour round trip, no matter how you go about it. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, like the departure time was five o'clock on a, on, a, on a Friday evening. Like most fellas, like of, of the age of the, of, the, of the rugby players, are going out for a pint after the week at that stage. And here, here are guys, and they have to go up to the north, long trip up, and they're not down maybe 12, 11 o'clock the following night. Like it's it's a 30 hour trip. I honestly think that the model as it, pre as it presently exists, um, I, I don't think it has a future. We have to have a change. Um, and I, I'd say that, you know, the, the change that's proposed and having the top two groups on an all island basis, and then, you know, for the want of a better word, I suppose, a provincial or a regional basis after that, I, I you know, I, I, I think we have to move in that direction. Now, how quick they'll move in that direction is another thing, because I suppose um, the way this season was 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 um, called to a halt in dramatic circumstances, um, one doesn't know, or I suppose one doesn't know either, um, at what stage if the new season will will get up and running. Now, um, there seems to be optimism that it will. Like the GAA have, um, they, they 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 have their roadmap for returning to playing games and and what have you. And I have no doubt that um, it's in gestation as well, a roadmap with, with, with the IRFU. But um, the nature of rugby, I suppose, is one of those ones with uh, such close contact that, you know, it may be one of the, it may be one of the last to get the green light to, to, to come back. Um, because it's, you know, it's, 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 it's so difficult, you know, to, to, to put the protocols the safety protocols for rugby in, 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 in place like um, it's such a close contact sport and such an intense close contact sport over 80, 80 minutes that one doesn't know. I, I wouldn't be too optimistic that we would see change in 12 months. We might, we might be looking at the season after next. I suppose, look, one thing they should mention as well is that the, the, the women's team and Buff, you know, that how important we've seen the Irish women's team in 30, 2013, I think, claim a grand slam, but it's kind of, they've kind of fallen away a bit in the last years, maybe not getting the backing that they should be getting from, from, uh, from the IRFU. But it's crucial that, you know, if we are to produce the amount of players or if we are to produce the required players at, 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 at international level, that all the areas, all the geographical areas are, are, are rowing in with, with women's teams. Actually, Brough, this is something I should have maybe pointed out earlier, but Brough was, had one of the first women's teams in the country. Um, Willie's wife, uh, Christine, was involved in setting up an annual uh, women's game between, correct me if I'm wrong now, Willie, a, a Brough ladies team uh, against a team made up of uh, women who worked in the banks. 
in Limerick That's City. Right. Yeah. So they had that annually every year for, for a few years and they used to get... Charity, a charity function. A charity yeah. game, yeah. And they'd have celebrities come and referee it like Tony Ward and, and Ginger McLaughlin and, and, yeah. and so on. And I actually, it, it wasn't Christine, it was someone else, um, Eileen Noonan I think said to me that it was one of the first teams, if not the first women's team in the country. Um, and I contacted a chap called Paul, Paul Rouse. Paul Rouse, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. He's a professor in UCD who has written quite a bit about women's rugby to ask him if he was aware whether or not a ladies team in 1978 would have been one of the first. And he reckoned that there's a very good chance they were the first ladies team at the time. So it may be that there is some ladies team that, that I, I, I haven't heard of that was there beforehand, but there are certainly groundbreakers in, in that respect. They needed some coaching, John. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a pleasure coaching them. <laughs> Going back to the the, the, the the regional situation again, um, as you, without the players, the players give their time free. They go to training, they drive to training free, you know, and they go to matches free and they don't charge anybody. No, they enjoy it and they don't let their club down. But the, with this new system, if they go back to it, you're also looking at matches under lights during the week. As well, and mm. let, let the guys be free for the weekend as well, which is important because the players are the guys. I mean, if you can get a match during the week, you're, you're, you're getting rid of a, a training night and you're a weekend off. So now you're making it easier again and not demanding so much on the players. Yeah, I think I, from, from, from my time playing, I think when you saw Friday night or even Monday night games, you were kind of thinking, yeah, Friday night under lights, Monday night under lights. It did free up the entire weekend, and it was it was it was a novelty, and again, something to look forward to. Absolutely, yeah, it's much more enjoyable. I mean, you, you get a real sense of occasion when you are playing under lights, and people can have a chance to have a few drinks and that then as well at it afterwards. So it's, it's yeah, that that's another definite benefit of it. Of course, one other important part of any club, um, we see that you know. Uh, Rough really have flaking facilities outside there, be it the pitches, the, the dressing rooms, all that. But that didn't just fall in uh, into the pitch and build itself. A lot of hard work from volunteers, fundraisers, all that sort of stuff. Um, and, and, you know, volunteers and coaches uh, with the underage structures. How important the role of the volunteer uh, in, in, in every club, but especially in rural clubs like Rough? I, I suppose, um, Raf, they're absolutely hugely important because I, I suppose the success of any organization um, or a lot of organizations anyway in particular sport, uh, a certain amount of sporting organizations I won't say all sporting organizations and not even all rugby because there's, there's uh, a, pro, a substantial um, professional element creeping into all sport now but the, the role of the volunteer or the active citizens you, you know is, is absolutely crucial and I suppose Prof have, have, have been lucky over the years um, with, with the amount of volunteers that, that they have got. And with, the, with a certain amount of um, volunteers, with a certain amount of expertise as well, which, you know, in the, the, develop, in the development of facilities was, was, um, was crucially important. And I suppose um, perhaps another reason as to the success of... of um, of the provision of the facilities is because in many cases and in many clubs and in many sporting organizations you know they they start to get this uh, get this idea and and get thrown in they're throwing in at the deep end and have this this huge um outlay and 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 you know and it, it causes all sorts of problems you know to sustain it and to service it afterwards i think the rough thing model uh, was was it was a gradual involvement and it, it was a gradual um it, you know it, it was a gradual de de development and like you know i, I suppose <laughs> Willie, I, I, I suppose it's fair to say you know i was involved for between chairman and secretary for about 12 or 13 years um you know a, a season um a season, um, I suppose, was measured, um, you know, for success, A, on the field, and I suppose B, off the field, and B was, I suppose, that, you know, that at the end of a particular season and at the end of a particular year, you know, that there was some enhancement 
uh, some tangible enhancement of the facility. So it, it was a gradual thing without ever ever jumping into in, 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 in too deep. Now, when you, when you mentioned volunteers in, in the club, and, and Brough has, has been blessed with volunteers over the years, um, you, you have to mention uh, the Brough Ladies Club, um, who, you know, who look after the kitchen and, uh, and have developed the kitchen there. And, um, you know, um, one slow and coming forward, um, looking for, and, and rightly so, in looking for the improvement of their facilities. And like the hospitality that they turn out in, uh, or turn out week after week for visiting teams or whatever functions are on there is extraordinary and you know it's an example of volunteerism at its best. Well I suppose I suppose uh, Raphael to go back again to the very start of the thing when I do recall uh, wondering where we we're going to get a pitch and we had looked at a pitch down by the Brough Road past the creamery there belonged to Bobby Ryan the only about it was a big pole or an electrical pole in the middle of the field, so that would cause a problem. And we moved here, moved there. And as I said, the first AGM we had was when the, the colonel arrived in the door and said, I met this guy this morning, and he said, call over to this meeting. And it was Roger Fenton sent him over. And that was my first meeting of Colonel O'Grady. And before he left the meeting, anyway, <laughs> he had a volunteer to give us a pitch and a lodge, which we changed into dressing rooms. So we had two dressing rooms with showers and with a pitch. Uh, a phenomenal fee, no, let me tell you as well. So without that, I mean, that was like Matt said there, you can buy something very expensive and have this thing around your neck and spend years trying to pay it back or whatever, or borrowing money in that. We were lucky. We didn't have to borrow money. We needed to pay for the thing with a, with a, with a, with a, with a whip round. And same flight to our back pitches which we got and he offered them as well uh, it was a bit more expensive but at the same time it wasn't enormous we were well able to, to pay for it straight away and that that helps volunteers because you let your people free then for your rugby and not be collecting money and running functions and trying to get money here and get money there you know and on the ladies committee and the ladies committee of course is fantastic i must say now they're so efficient they're incredible I mean, the food there on a Saturday, you'd nearly, you'd nearly beg to get into it to eat it because it's so lovely, you know. But as well as that thing of the ladies' rugby, and you're, you're looking at the moment we have Fiona Steed, who was an ex international herself, who be John Hayes' wife. And she, she runs a tight ship now, I'm saying. She has about seven or eight teams going. And she's incredibly good. And we're lucky to have her as well. You're lucky, you're lucky to have good volunteers, Matt. They don't grow on trees, you know. Mm. And everybody that's there always pulled their weight, I think. Anyway. Yeah, but, but 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 Willie, I suppose it's fair to say like that when when there when there be something on, when there be a job on, and you look for volunteers, you never had you never had a problem in filling the complement. Never, I never have a problem in filling the department, and they'd be productive as well. You know, so that's the most important. It is very easy to get volunteers who might go smoking a fag in the corner and do nothing, but everyone <laughs> does something. They take a job to do something. You know. So, yeah. John, I suppose as a guy who's uh, been studying a lot about the, the past of the club, uh, where, where do you see the future for Brough? I know it's a, a very, uh, uh, how long is a piece of rope kind of question, but yeah, you know, yeah. where, where, for sustainable rugby, what has to happen for Brough? I think continue relying on the underage. Um, we, we're, we're, I mean, we don't really have a choice but to rely upon our underage because I mean, we are, we are in a rural area. We don't really have as much of a connection at all, really, with Munchens as what we would have had in the past. I mean, when I played under-20s with Brough, I was one of two on the starting 15 who didn't go to Munchens. Uh, I, I don't know if, if there's anywhere like that same level of representation there anymore. So I think perhaps if, if you know, maybe we could try and foster a similar type of relationship with other secondary schools in, in the area that are closer, perhaps hospital or something like that. But either way, we'd have to continue relying on our, on our underage because we're not in the middle of a big population centre. We, we don't pay players. We can't just pay someone to come out and play for us. Um, so that's been what has stood us in good stead in the past. So I think it's going to be the same in the future. Um, obviously, you know, continue on having the same excellent level of volunteering that we have, hopefully remaining as a senior club. I'd be quite optimistic that we can stay as a senior club. Um, 
Oh, what else? Yeah, hopefully, actually, I would like to see the, the, the ladies' team continue to grow and get stronger and stronger and hopefully start to, to, to field ladies' teams at even more underage levels. I think that would be fantastic. Like Matt said, or the matter really said, like we're, we're very lucky to have someone like Fiona Steve there um, amidst our ranks. Um, so I think that would be a great thing to see, to see happen as well, and obviously for the, for the men's teams to remain strong also. Matt, I'll throw it back to you. Yeah, Raf, I, I would agree totally, um, obviously, and um, we could see it coming from the time it was mooted that, that um, uh, St. Munchens College, and I say this as an old Munchens boy, um, that once it was mooted that Munchens College um, was um, ceasing to be a boarding school, um, that, that it was going to let, you know, that it was going to leave a void out. And um, I, I think to make up for that, um, Ruff just have to concentrate on the underage. Like there is a very, very good underage structure there. And I, I suppose in fairness, John, um, it, it, it's fair to say that as, as a rural club would go, um, that the Bruff numbers at underage level are still being been maintained and 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 are very very healthy but i i i see i i, I think um, um from a bluff point of view I, I i i really think that their trump card is there's a neat house running through the club um which in my opinion um you know it it, it strives to be the best you, they can whether on or off the field and and um you know, I would have no worries um, um, for, for the club going forward. Now, it, it, it would involve continuous hard work, particularly at under the age level. But I would have no worries about about, about the club going forward, none whatsoever. None whatsoever. Now, obviously, you know, there are going to be changes um, in the structures, and it, it will be a matter of how do you adjust to, to those changes. Um, but Brough have adjusted in the past, like they have adjusted in making the transition um, from junior rugby to senior rugby. And I, I will always remember, and lads, you probably remember it as well, the very first um, senior game over in Kilbalion Park and the, uh, the, uh, the first game as a senior club against Clannacilty. And Clannacilty were 7-0 up within 90 seconds. And geez, I said to myself, what's, what's going on here? Or, or what's this all about? You know, but like... Um, Brough adopted uh, adapted very 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 quickly to senior rugby and and um, you know I, I I think there is a capacity within the club there's a flexibility within the club and there's a willingness within the club to adapt to whatever situation is put in front of them and I I I think that has still stood them in good stead in the past and I think it will stand them in good stead going into the future. Uh, Willie, uh, just for yourself, I suppose. Uh, and I'll ask the other two lads after your your favourite memories of the club so far, or, or, or funniest story. Which one, or both? Oh God! Uh, I do remember the first day out when one of the second I was asked uh, where to whip my head. <laughs> someone said between the front row's legs, meaning the prop and the hooker, but he didn't take it up like that. So you can imagine, yeah, man, the prop was walking around like what up for the week, and the other guy was walking around with a hunter in back. <laughs> However, the last few minutes we changed it, you know. But I, I suppose uh, you have to say the achievements, uh, the winning the All Ireland under 16s, 18s, and under 20s was enormous for us. You know, we won the 18s in, in Lansdowne Road, actually. We won the 20s in Tongan Park against UCC. I think it was Corinthians we beat in 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 in, in, in Metrovivia and we beat fine. And of course getting promoted and going to Cena Rugby was an incredible achievement, you know. Little did we know at the time what was going to happen or come about. When you consider you were trying to make phone calls to get players on the pitch, you know, and visiting houses to try and get guys out of retirement. I mean, if you go back again another bit when the Munchens thing was going the time. And um, Mick Soher was my man in Brough, and he'd say, Well, there's a guy down the road there. Uh, he, he played the scrum half. You might talk to him. Donald O'Grady from Bell and Gary would have been the scrum half. Neil is still, everything he is doing in his house, and made his mother and father. I'd never known Neil is in my life, you know, and he was 19 at the time, and he's still 19. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, uh, we'll go back to the future again, Raphael. Um, only the other day we were talking about having a meeting. And we have a senior club, a senior team to prepare for next season. We also have a 20s team and another, a second team to prepare for next season and an 18s team. Now, we were very strong in those grades last year. 18s went to the Munster final in the play blow and try against, uh, I'm not too sure, it must be in Cork Con, I think. And we did okay. We got as far as that. So that means our 20s were good. Then the 18s were very prominent last year as well with some fine players. Some of them had gone into the Munster Academy. And so it doesn't look too bad, but I mean, you have to just keep working at it all the time. These guys are not going to volunteer their services themselves. They're going to have to be spoken to and brought along and helped along. Because then being 18 and doing your leave insert and uh, meeting an odd woman and things like that, it's not going to be easy to play rugby as well, you know. So we have to keep him talking and that. Look at John Hogan, the poor devil. He's you know, he only, he only met a woman lately. You know, he's around for a long time. I've met plenty of odd women. <laughs> <laughs> John? So, I mean, you know, it, it, it just, it's the volunteering again, Raphael. You know, people give him their time. I mean, for Bruff to achieve what they've achieved has taken an awful lot of people a lot of time. And we've all enjoyed it. We've you, all enjoyed it. Your, uh, your, your best memories, John? I suppose winning the Bateman Cup, winning the All-Ireland Cup uh, is, is, is probably a standout one. But I was on the bench for that game and, and, and I didn't actually come on in the final. But we beat Black Rock in an under-20s game. The, we got to the All-Ireland semi-final the year. I was under-20s or and it, I was a year under the, the top age for it, let's say. Uh, and we beat Black Rock in a game that I don't think anyone expected us to win because they were a super team like and they, they hammered everyone. Um, and... They came down and they were leading on three separate occasions in the game and we won it with a try uh, with only a few seconds left. So I think that's, a, that's a, probably one of my standout memories. Believe it or not, I, I have a strange one that is, is also a great memory as well. Only a few years ago, during the summer, towards the end of the summer, we had a fundraiser. As, as a fundraiser, we collected scrap metal. Um, so we just basically drove around the county for... One day in particular, but really for a few days in advance of it as well, to collect any bit of scrap metal we could get. And just the greatest crack that we had. Like, everyone became amateur scrap metal dealers for, for a few hours. And just absolutely brilliant. Fellas would just develop an eye for seeing little bits of scrap sticking out of a ditch or something like that. So that's kind of a strange one, but it was an awful lot of fun. And it goes back again to the idea of there being fantastic volunteers and, and, and you know, great people involved in the club. and, and the, 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 the enjoyment that people get out of pulling together and, and supporting the club as well because obviously that was all just to raise raise funds to, to support the club you know Matt your, your favourite memories uh, there are many there are many Raf um, uh, ones like the lads that said the, 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 the under 20 um, you know winning winning the charity cup for the first time beating Bowes winning the Munster cup for the first time you know um, but I think my standout moment um, was when the final whistle went in Cole Rail. Because I remember sitting where I'm sitting now, not in this chair. I have replaced the chair since. But, um, and I remember getting the correspondence from the IRFU, um, setting out what the round robin on that particular year um, was and um, of course mindful of how narrowly we missed it last year and what it threw up anyway was we opened with a home game against Monaghan the Connacht champions after which as Willie has recounted there a while ago we had to travel to Dublin to play a sea point and then to call rain and I just remember saying to myself when I opened the letter the IRFU sure don't do not want Bruff to be seen there it, it looked so formidable. Uh, home to the Connacht champions, no disrespect to the Connacht champions, and we struggled a bit to beat, beat, beat Mona Bay on the particular day. We didn't have to travel to the Leinster and Ulster champions. And the manner in which the lads dug out a 7 6 victory against Sea Point in the wind and rain out in an open, bleak space in some part of the leafy suburbs of Dublin was incredible and then it was all hanging on the game in cold rain and um, what a performance on on the particular day what a weekend it was um many had traveled up the night before and um then then you had the, you, you know you had the game 
Yeah. And I suppose it was a game we, we won comfortably in the end. Um, yes, yes. I, I, I would say like that um, the deal was sealed long before the referee blew the final whistle. But once he blew the final whistle, there was a palpable sense of relief that we had achieved something absolutely incredible. incredible and yeah. that would be my standout moment. Well, for us, for, for us, older people, say, who had been there since day one, to, to achieve that was incredible, you know, for Matt who, and myself, for you know, Nicholas and all those fellas, you know, they were there. Uh, it was incredible, you know. But uh, going back to what John Hogan was talking about a while ago, we played Black Rock, a super-duper team from Dublin in the 20s, and they came to Brough and we beat them. We also brought lands down to Brough, if you remember, and uh, we beat them. They arrived by helicopter, Mick Quinn yeah. was in charge of them. And we beat him as well. And Mick was getting very annoyed with the referee, who was Poppy Bennett from Richmond. He forgot who he was talking to. Anyway, <laughs> but a, a story I heard, John, about this Black Rock thing, yeah? They stopped in the four items for some sandwiches. And some old guy was at the counter, and he said to him, how are you getting on? Said, Where are you off to? Oh, we're going to Broth Plain Rugby. Who are you? You're, you're, we're, we're Black Rock in Dublin. I'll tell you, we're in for some shock when you go up there, he says, anyway. So, so mm -hmm. I think they got nervous straight away. So that helped a lot, John. <laughs> <laughs> that I have heard, I, I've heard teams to say it, that there is kind of like some mental edge or some teams would say who are not from Limerick, who are not used to driving out to Brough. If they're coming from Dublin or the North in particular, once they get to Limerick, they think, oh, we're, we're there, like we're surely only a few minutes away. And that extra bit of a drive, I have been told by a few people, gives us that little bit of a mental edge. Yeah, they get nervous then because they're happy getting the Limerick. They know that bit. Now they say, oh, geez, another 20 miles. Oh, my God, what's out here? I've never been there before. So they're wondering where they're going and <laughs> what's where they're facing. <laughs> Which helped it. We walked in our honour in, in our favour as well, of course. Yeah, yeah. Raf, ta talking of Lansdowne and talk of the, uh, talking of the sandwiches, Lansdowne brought their own sandwiches in the backs of their Mercedes. Um, and their toilet rolls as well. Sorry? <laughs> their toilet and, rolls. Yeah, and they, 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 um, a certain well-known gentleman in Irish life, we saw this helicopter descending from the sky. Nobody had been contacted. Um, and um, he landed on the back pitch, yeah. and um, he was he was a Lansdowne supporter, and um, you know it didn't matter. Um, we didn't get the chance on the particular day to offer him hospitality because they seemed to be um, refusing it from the start with the bootloads of sandwiches and flasks and everything that they had. But we didn't give them hospitality on the pitch either. We sent them home with their tail between their legs out of the competition. And that was the second time we beat him up there as well. Yeah. When we won the team, I think. And I remember at the kickoff, some smart Dublin guy in the pack was leading the pack and he says, Come on, Lansdowne, these are only a crowd of cow shit boys from the country. And I think the, boy, I think the boys heard that and that finished Lansdowne. <laughs> And uh, I, 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 are you going to, will there be a fundraising campaign for a helicopter out in Brough anytime soon, or is that the purpose of the requirements? <laughs> well, well I, 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 I don't know, but the, but the, but the curiosity, um, the, the, the curiosity, and you know I'm not curious, that curious, Raph, uh, got the bet on me on the, on the particular day, so I sought out the pilot, and I asked him, I suppose it was an ignorant question, but I, it was a straight question. And that was back, I suppose, lads, in 2000, which is nearly 20 years ago, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I asked him, how much was it costing to get the helicopter down here? Well, he said, from the time I go into the cockpit or whatever it is, it's until I get out of it, um, having dropped his man to and from, it's 1,600 euros an hour. Oh, jeez. <laughs> and to be beaten, and to be, be beaten, and to be beaten, and to be beaten after that. But there's just one point I want to make. Um, like you know, you stand out. Um, the, the, the under twenty success was a standout um, performance, and and winning the Munster Cup was a standout performance. But what's sometimes forgotten is that Prof. Dam went close to retaining bottom, and um, the year after we winning the under twenty. 
we lost to what I would consider a controversial try um, to UCC in, in, in the final in Moscow Park. And the year after beating Gary Owen in, in, in the Munster Cup, we lost narrowly to him the following year again in the Cup final. So it, it, it wasn't a one year wonder um, with your um, Bohemian's hat on your um, ref. Um, we weren't one year wonders. <laughs> we, we had lost a player in the second year against UCC. A back, a very notable back. His name was David Conway. He had busted his knee against Gary Owen. And quite honestly, they were working off of kind of a panel of, you know, they're tight enough and they didn't have a replacement, you know. And he was, he, well, I quite much somebody. He was a good player and he was a hit with Owen Cahill. The two of them were very good. And, uh, you know, we're all the backs. We just couldn't afford to miss anybody. And I think had they got, had him playing along with the whole team again, they would have done, they, they would have probably retained the match. I think. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I think the referee on the particular day missed a very, very crucial decision. That's right. Yeah, yeah. As well, that that it actually denied us of, of, of making it back to backs, you know? Yeah. As somebody who sat beside uh, Mr. O'Callaghan at numerous uh, GA matches and seen his uh, critique in of referees, let's just say I, I, I wouldn't put that uh, <laughs> wouldn't put that beyond him. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm balanced when it comes to referees, Raf. <laughs> I, I often refer to him when we talk uh, all things Limerick GA about the green tinted mist that seems to descend. Uh, and I'm sure that when it turns to rugby, that it's a, a, a yellow tinge that seems to cloud his judgment from time to time. <laughs> you know, it, it's it's very easy, Raf, to transition from green to yellow. Yeah, true. You know, and like him, um, you know, green and gold, I suppose, or green and yellow. I have them most Saturdays during the year, like because I have one on my my um. I'm usually at a GA match, but I certainly have the rough thing in my hand, um, seeing how they're doing it. Uh, hoping for blow by blow, you know, just um, wishing I were there, you know. Yeah. Lads, listen, thanks so much to all three of you for, for, for coming on the podcast. Um, I really appreciate it. And uh, let's hope that, uh, uh, you know, if, if we're all back here in 50 years' time describing the 100 years of rough, then uh, we've made some serious advancements in medical technology. But uh, uh, maybe we'll come back in the 60th. Thanks so much for, for joining us on the show. Thank you, Raphael. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sound lights.